All right, welcome back to the Sal Greco Show. This is episode four. We're going to discuss something we were discussing in the previous episode. The actions or the affiliations or the associations with the restaurant in the industrial section of the Bronx, Conso Frito. I was a New York City Police Department officer for 14 years. I had an unblemished record. Along the way, somebody there was irked that I was a friend of Roger Stone and I was a supporter of President Trump. Therefore, they started a 19-month witch hunt. They used illegal subpoenas. They violated court orders. And, and the final result of this was they themselves said that I had no civil or criminal liabilities. Any event that happened on January 6th prior, after... The last 14 years, there was nothing there. The only thing they were really harping on was the fact that I was a friend of Roger Stone. This goes back to the patrol guide. So the patrol guide is the book of rules that governs the New York City Police Department. And you have to follow these rules. It's a, that's why they call it a guide. So the rule that they said I violated is there's a rule in there that states you cannot wrongfully or knowingly associate with someone who is reasonably believed to have engaged in or likely to have engaged in criminal activity. They're calling Roger Stone a criminal. In their eyes, he's the big bad wolf. He's my friend. I like him. Many other people like him. President Trump likes him. Some people don't. And they'll use their power to try to say, you shouldn't be hanging around him, which is in violation of your civil rights, who you can associate with. As long as this doesn't get involved with your official duties as an officer or have anything to do with anything police related, you should be okay. But Apparently not with these people. So I ended up where they had ultimately terminated me. And their final judgment on me, it said that my continued employment with the NYPD would be detrimental to the police department due to my relationship and friendship with Roger Stone. That's fine. I sued them. Later on, they actually invited another convicted criminal of theirs that they're friends with, Cardi B who's a well-known rapper, has sung songs about uh, cops, hating cops, and uh, violence, and all the stuff she sings about. And uh, they had her at the police academy. They paraded her around a, po a secure police facility, hobnobbing with her, taking pictures, taking videos. That was fine and dandy, apparently. So I referenced this in my lawsuit, which got past their motions to dismiss. And that brings us to the present day. We're in the discovery phase. But Along the way, it came to my attention that there was this restaurant in the Bronx, in the industrial section there of Zariga near Commerce Avenue. It's called Consafrito. It's a restaurant bar lounge, apparently. I also came to find out that the current police commissioner, Ed Caban, which is the first deputy commissioner at the time of when they were persecuting me, Ed Caban, his brother, Richard Caban, who's a former NYPD lieutenant, he's the owner. Okay, the liquor license is under his name there, Consafrito. Now, if you look on LinkedIn, the creator and manager of this place is Jimmy Rodriguez Jr. Now, Jimmy Rodriguez is an entrepreneur, a restaurateur. He's very infamous in New York. Why, you ask? He owned a place in the 90s called Jimmy's Bronx Cafe. This place was beyond infamous. It's so infamous that Major League Baseball banned their players from even stepping foot in this place for two years. You've had uh, famous people that also have records, Fat Joe and Peter Guns. They constantly at Jimmy's Bronx Cafe. They were constantly always around Jimmy. Jimmy's also well known in the political field. He's been pictured with Bill Clinton. He's also a mob associate. I'm going to put this up. It's from Sit Down News. It's a podcast, a guy named John Panisi. Anthony Guzzo and I were not yet members. We were associates at the time. Because of this incident, and more importantly, to protect us from any retribution, we were fast-tracked to being inducted, which took place two weeks later on April 2nd, 2013. The story I'm about to relay took place during the two weeks after the strip club incident and prior to us being inducted. Actually, it was days before the induction ceremony. It's important to note, at this time, our names were on a list that were being passed around for proposed members into the Lucchese crime family. Anthony Guzzo had gotten in touch with me and asked me to meet with him. And I believe I met him at his house in Staten Island that day. Back then, Anthony had been dealing narcotics with some guy from the Bronx. Remember, he wasn't inducted yet, so the no drug rule didn't apply to him. 
If he was caught dealing drugs, his name could have been removed from the proposed list, or he could have received a warning to stop doing what he was doing. But the worst case scenario, he could have been chased from the family. None of the above happened because Anthony never got caught. So when I met with Anthony, he told me that this guy that he was dealing with in the Bronx offered him a good opportunity. He wanted to discuss it with me to see if I would get involved in it. Supposedly, the owner of the restaurant, Don Coqui, needed a favor. Don Coqui was located in the City Island section of the Bronx. According to what Anthony was told, the guy lent out $2 million and was unsuccessful in reclaiming his money. Allegedly, the restaurant owner was willing to give up 10% of the money if we could collect it. Anthony said we would split $100,000 each, so naturally I agreed to get involved. To be honest, at this time, the strip club incident wasn't even on my mind. We set a date for a few days later, and we would go take a ride to the Bronx and talk to the owner of the restaurant. When I left Anthony that day, I wanted to go do my homework on the owner of this restaurant. I went and spoke to a few people. One person in particular was Big John. I found out that the owner's name was Jimmy Rodriguez, and he owned several restaurants, including Jimmy's Bronx Cafe, Jimmy's Uptown, and Jimmy's Downtown. Big John had told me not long before we spoke, he had taken a girl out to lunch, I think in the Uptown restaurant. He said when he arrived at the restaurant, it wasn't open for lunch yet, but the owner happened to be there and let them sit down and order anyway. John said they made small talk with him and he was a nice guy. But I also found out that Jimmy Rodriguez had borrowed money in the past. When it comes to a sit down, whether it's one face in opposition or a friendly one, you should know who you're talking to as well as any information available about them. After finding out everything I could, I wasn't happy with this information because a person who borrows money is rarely lending out two million. I'm not saying it's impossible, but highly unlikely. So for me, it was a red flag. I found out later that he checked the assessment of the property, not the appraisal. The assess for tax purposes mm -hmm. is different from what appraised property. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was assessed for a million dollars or a million five. So he pulled out of the deal. I said, well, but I don't have the money. I'll pay you when eventually I get into this deal. And, you know, I remember like going to 100 black men and asking them for help. And they said, we can help you, but we can't help the whole village. We'll, we'll help you because we know who you are and that's how we'll do it. And you always look up to these guys and that was the beginning of Jimmy's. And then I did Jimmy's downtown, Jimmy's uptown, Jimmy's City Island. But I knew this information would come in handy when we did speak to this guy. On the day we were going to the Bronx, Anthony and I met at his cousin's house in Belmo, Long Island. We went over everything once again. I told him what I learned. And as usual, Anthony wanted to go in separate cars. And he wanted to use separate cars so that after we were done, he could go straight home from the Bronx. This was because his wife had him under a lot of pressure and he allowed her to question every hour that he was out. After we left Anthony's cousin's house and I got in my car and he got in his, as I was driving, I was starting to go over this whole thing in my head. Something wasn't sitting right with me. Something was off. And then it hit me. I called Anthony, who was in the car in front of me, and I asked him one question. I remember when Anthony first told me about his venture in the junk business, I had warned him to be careful. And he had told me that the guy he was dealing with was a good guy that was around people in the Bronx, which means he was an associate to one of the Bronx crews. So my question to Anthony was, did this guy from the Bronx just bring this opportunity up in conversation or did he reach out to you about it? Anthony said that the guy called him and asked to meet with him and then he told him about it. I shook my head. I told Anthony, pull the car over. I need to talk to you. Earlier, I mentioned when Anthony first discussed his opportunity with me, the strip club incident was the last thing on my mind. But at this moment, it was the only thing on my mind. We pulled our cars over and I got out and I asked Anthony another question. Why would a guy who's around people get the opportunity to make money and not bring that opportunity to those people? Yet, he wants to offer this opportunity to Anthony, a guy he's not associated with and a guy who's not part of their crew. I asked him if it made any sense to him. He said, now that I think of it, it doesn't make any sense. Then I reminded him that just two weeks earlier, we were involved in an incident where a Genovese captain got cracked in his face. Now back to the sit down we had at the Lucchese Social Club. Stevie Korea told us that day that the Genovese family gave him a list of names of all the people that were involved in the incident. So I reminded Anthony that the Genovese family had all our names on a list. Then I told Anthony the most important piece of this puzzle. Ralphie Bassamo was from the Bronx, the same area where the guy who offered Anthony this money-making opportunity, an area where everyone calls each other their cousins, even if they're not related. Also, conveniently, the meeting location was at a restaurant located on City Island. For those of you not familiar with City Island, there is one way on and one way off that island. When I explained all this to Anthony and explained that this is the perfect setup, 
His face got a lot paler. I told him, if you still want to go, I'll go under one condition. We go get pistols. We agreed on that, and we got back in our cars. But a few blocks later, Anthony pulled over again. I pulled my car behind him and got out of my car, and he said to me, you know, Nancy warned me about the same thing. Nancy was his wife. As soon as he said this, I knew it was a lie. He called Nancy as soon as he got in the car, and he told her what I just said, and she agreed with me. But he was giving his wife the credit. Ultimately, Anthony didn't even want to go anymore, even with pistols. He kept shaking his head and saying, I can't believe I didn't see this. This definitely had him spooked. I told him, if this guy from the Bronx calls you to ever want to meet with you, be very careful. But he said after this, he wasn't meeting with him no more. Before we went our separate ways that day, he turned to me and said something. He said, you know, Nancy's smart. She's my little consigliere. I just smiled, got in my car and left. But what I wanted to tell him was, no, Joe DiNapoli is your consigliere. Did I have proof that Ralphie Bassamo planned the sneak move? I didn't have any proof. Did I think that this is exactly what was involved? Absolutely. Jimmy's allegedly a mob associate. And then we reference Jimmy's Cafe. Let me tell you what somebody said about Jimmy Cafe and what used to go on over there. Look how Jose Reyes ended up. Yeah, like, a Reyes like a mutt. Like a mutt. Come on, bro. Jose Reyes was Come nipping on, cocaine in the Bronx. That, on, that's bro. different. That's different. That's different. He's just sniffing like, cocaine. What was the Yankees? Yeah, what was yeah, they do from yeah, Yankees yeah, Stadium? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. that fucking ball. <laughs> Marico de Caribe. Come on, bro. Yeah. That was Jimmy's Cafe. Who did it here? You from Soundview? Jimmy's Cafe. My man, I was upstate in Camsta. And I used to hear about the liners at the bathroom. They say, yo, there's a side out. Yo, Cuba, you got to get out of Sing Sing, Kamsta. You got to go to Jimmy's Cafe. I say, what they got? <laughs> Lobsters? They say, no, they got a cocaine buffet. They got all the Yankees, Bernie Williams, everybody. <laughs> so don't pull I'm Jose sorry, Reyes, the singing merengue right now. In, in the, uh, you brought him up. No, 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 you said Jose I Reyes. You I hit him up. So he motherfucker. What did I bring him up? All I know that Jose Reyes was sniffing cocaine and fucking whores. Jimmy's Cafe had incidents like this. There's cocaine buffets. You know, now you're, you're hearing that he's a mob associate. So in actuality, should the police department or any kind of law enforcement in general be associating around somebody like this or in a place that this kind of environment is allowed to fester? So... In the New York City Police Department, there is also rules that you can't go to places like this. In fact, they make lists of uh, unlawful locations, which this would automatically be on. Because you can't be at a place that's known to have a history like this, okay? But that's not what happened here. So joining us here is my good friend, co-host of his own podcast with John McCary, former NYPD lieutenant. Eric Dim. Eric, welcome to the Sal Greco Show. How are you? Outstanding pleasure. It's it's an honor to call you my friend, and thank you for having me on your podcast now. So, Eric, I was just going over the history of not only Consafrito and the New York City Police Department and their association there, but Jimmy Rodriguez. And I had told the audience that uh, Jimmy's Cafe in the Bronx, you, you kind of knew a little bit about it because you yourself, you worked in the Bronx at the time when uh, he was... I guess, right before or during one of his places while it was still open. Uh, you, you, can you uh, give any details or anything that you knew about the history of, of Jimmy Rodriguez or his uh, restaurant there in the Bronx? Well, sure. Actually, yeah. so uh, I actually had a girlfriend in the Bronx um, many years ago that she had. Uh, she was in the restaurant business in the Bronx herself. So I did hear the name before. I didn't know him personally. I heard the name, and I, I heard he's someone that you want to avoid when it comes to dealing with business because he doesn't have a good reputation with money when it comes to others. So that, that was, and I did hear that uh, he did have some potential ties to a criminal association, but that was as far as the extent went when it comes to my knowledge of uh, Jimmy Rodriguez. I knew that he had uh, some prior restaurants. I know that he had uh, most of his business dealings were with uh, a restaurant called Don Coquie. I know there was Jimmy Bronx Cafe, things of that sort. Meeting you and becoming your friend I gained knowledge of his business dealings at Casa Fritos and his association with the NYPD, which we love to highlight as a hypocrisy to the termination, to the wrongful termination of yourself. So then you would say Jimmy's Cafe and Jimmy Rodriguez himself 
would definitely be someone that the NYPD mm-hmm. would definitely or shouldn't be anywhere near, correct? Well, absolutely. So one thing that has always been pushed to members of the NYPD from the inception that I was on the job myself, and I, I would assume the same for you, is that sometimes the appearance of impropriety is enough to avoid for members of the service just so that you don't have a dark eye on the police department. Even if there's no confirmation of wrongdoing, but just the appearance of impropriety or just a rumor is enough for you to avoid just to keep the NYPD safe to protect the, the reputation of the NYPD. Can you go over a little bit over first the rule about the criminal association and then the other rule of, let's say, unlawful locations? Because those are two things I need the, the, uh, the audience to understand about the NYPD. Oh, excellent. So it's a two-part question, right? So let's first examine and give our perspective and uh, what is factual about criminal association with the NYPD. So it's actually in the patrol guide, the NYPD patrol guide, and it's actually written very vague which is extremely problematic that we now found could be used to protect someone if they're in a circle of nepotism, or it could be used to actually be weaponized against someone that doesn't fall in line with politics penetrating the NYPD, which was what happened to you, So according to the NYPD patrol guide, if you knowingly have information of a person of interest, a subject, a, a potential friend, that they have a criminal record, or if they're likely to commit a crime, you cannot associate with that person. So that is where I find extremely problematic. How are you supposed to know that they are likely to commit a crime? And it also does not encompass what crimes we talk about, right? Because I believe it should be crimes that affect you doing your duty as a police officer. Obviously, you should not associate someone that has a past of selling drugs or is potentially selling drugs at this time. But if someone that maybe had a white collar type of crime and they served their time, that's something completely different. It's something that we can explore because people do deserve a second chance. And that doesn't necessarily affect your employment as a member of the NYPD. Now, along with the second part, as a member of the NYPD, you are held to certain standards. And when it comes to being a patron at different establishments, there is categories that the NYPD has depicted that you should avoid. So we have what's considered off-limits locations. So those locations have what we said before, have an appearance of impropriety, that they have potentially given free items to police officers for their benefit. So that's something that you would avoid if it's in the command that you work in. So if I was working in the 4 or 5 precinct, I would not go to Casa Fritos if they're in an off-limits location because it's in my place, my geographical area of appointment. There is also unauthorized locations if they don't have the permits up to speed or the, the proper documentation with the SLA, which is the State Liquor Authority. And then we also have what's called cooping pro locations that you wouldn't go somewhere where police officers have an opportunity to sleep while they're on duty. But really what comes to this is exactly that. Off-limits locations and unauthorized. So uh, I I guess you want to get to that. Yes, because uh, if it's unauthorized or unlawful, and we're going back to the first place he had, which already had all the incidents. There was shootings, there was stabbings, there was uh, all kinds of drug deals being alleged. It was so bad that Major League Baseball banned their players from even going to Jimmy's Cafe for at least two years. So with that being said, how would the NYPD justify that, number one, the police commissioner himself and his buddies, his all ex- executives, all hanging out, not only at Concerfrito, but with Jimmy Rodriguez? And then, two, how do you justify hanging around someone who, yes, is a self-admitted criminal, a mob associate, and on top of it, he's either the creator, manager, whatever you want to call it, of this place who's actually owned by the police commissioner's brother, who's actually endangering the public in that they were having a shed that is in the back that is a public safety hazard and a fire trap. It's on record. It's already documented, and they admitted that they knew this by their stipulated agreement that they're leaving by August, that they have to pay 14000 in legal fees, they owe the water bill, they owe, they're going to pay their rent every month until then, otherwise the marshal will come. How do you justify this if you're a New York City police? How, how is this allowed? Absolutely. There is no justification 
for the association of the NYPD with Casa Fritos, especially which is painted around Jimmy Rodriguez. And just the rumors I heard alone, which is probably about 10 to 12 years ago, and if anything of what I've seen, he has only progressed in the restaurant business in New York City, especially the Bronx. And the fact that the NYPD police commissioner, his brother, has a direct connection with Casa Fritos is another reason for the NYP to avoid it just to alleviate the potential allegation of getting benefits because your brother is part of that business. And also the rumors that were spoken of, the, the scuttlebutt, the gossip of Jimmy Rodriguez that is known and that we know. And now the information that actually has come to light, we actually have an actual conversation with a mob associate talking about Jimmy Rodriguez. And we actually know from numerous independent sources that credible information that Jimmy Rodriguez has a very checkered past. So there is absolutely no justification. But what it does highlight is what John and I have been talking about on our podcast is that this particular administration is drunk with power and it lacks integrity, and it lacks transparency, and it lacks a standard. Because this, if there was a standard, the standard would be that those that are consorting at Casa Fritos would be terminated just like you. And if anything, it's far worse. Because the allegation of the association that they claim you have doesn't even apply. Because you were wrongfully terminated for association with Roger Stone. Now, Roger, Roger Stone is not a criminal. He is a, uh, an innocent man, and so are you, Sal. So this is a complete hypocrisy. There's no justification for the NYPD consorting at this location. Not only that, it's, we're talking about the entire upper echelon of the NYPD spends quite a lot of time at Casa Fritos having parties. Paternal organizations have parties there. But what I find extremely problematic, even more than that, is the Internal Affairs Bureau of the NYPD has had parties and associations at this location also. So how could this, going forward, based on the allegations you made, which have come true, and the allegations that myself and John have made, how could they come forth as a transparent investigation when the internal affairs is associating at this location under the same higher-ups that are in charge of them? That's exactly my point. And that's where I'm going to reference the first article here. Concerfrito, Eric Adams, birthday spot owned by NYP commissioner's brother, parties on an illegal built space. The Bronx restaurant and bar is facing eviction called a public safety hazard by judge. NYPD members and their boss regularly congregate in its unpermitted outdoor shed. As it remains, it may have chosen to celebrate in a space that was at the time and remains today in violation of multiple city safety codes facing more than a dozen citations for dangerous conditions by the fire department. The party shed at Concertfrieda has been deemed an illegally constructed structure by the Department of Buildings. This is the place, what it looked like. This is the shed right here, okay? This is how the gate was. So they were partying in this gate, okay? And this is when the judge came down with, with this stuff, all right? And look, here's, here's Jimmy Rodriguez's Instagram and whatever, and then here's picture of there's eric adams celebrating in that shed all right and, and look here's a list adams commissioner caban former police commissioner who's involved in my case who fired me Keyshawn swell dermot shea carl hasty not mentioned here was darcel clark and uh Letitia james at the time of the mayor's last visit last year the restaurant already been cited first by the department of buildings then by the fire department for various code violations. The landlord, Joseph Donald III, initiated an eviction lawsuit in September. On January 6th of this year, 2024, the landlord alleges the owners ignored a judge's December 26th order to stop using the outside space and threw a party there that included numerous members of the NYPD. City building inspectors visited a week later on January 12th but couldn't gain access to the property. A Department of Building spokesman said they plan to revisit the spot in the coming days. Well, look what the Donna said. It is clear to respondents no respect for the law or this court. Respondent has and will continue to do as it pleases regardless of the law, the lease, or the court's orders. If there was a fire or other catastrophe in the structure or at the property, it is not just possible, but likely there will be serious injury or worse to members of the public. When we look at this, right, it's important that we look at 
the appearance of impropriety, right? So let's first talk about the fact there's a potential criminal association, right? So just knowing that based on rumor, it's likely to believe that he will commit some type of crimes would make a violation of the NYPD procedure criminal association. So anyone that is a member of the NYPD and has taken part in fraternal meetings at this location, parties, I mean, we've actually seen brochures of Christmas parties at different events at Concert Fritos. Even after you have been on every talk show known to men day in and day out, and this has been actually put out by Curtis Sliwa and other political figures that actually have a great reach out there. So it's the NYPD upper echelon is well aware that there is an allegation out there. So the allegation on its own is just enough for the NYPD to stop their association with Jimmy Rodriguez and Casa Fritos. Rhetorically speaking, let's just say that that was not an issue. Let's pretend Jimmy Rodriguez is the most upstanding citizen in the United States, and the NYPD does have an association there. And we have these violations. We have the violation of the shed, which is a fire hazard. Here's why is it a problem. If you are a business operating in New York City, and you have violations with the SLA, most businesses do have violations with the SLA. Minor, they're in and out of court. It's kind of part of the business. However, this particular allegation or violation is a major violation because it's a safety issue. Right? It goes back to the history of Happy Land, where people in a location that, where there's too much occupants and it's a fire hazard. You know, years ago there was a thing called the cabaret license. Do they have a right to dance there because of the room and the occupancy? This is all a fire hazard. So the question for other New York City businesses is this. If we had these violations that could actually get us locked down, we would be locked out immediately, but this location is still operating with known violations along with the NYPD upper management is having parties there. So we see businesses being treated differently. So that is a huge problem. And also with that comes into question, how are they keeping this secret? Because in the NYPD, you have something, March operations. And that was an acronym for different, different agencies. And what that means is that the fire department, the department of buildings, the police department would get together and they would, would do a surprise visit at different businesses under the SLA to make sure that that business is operating safely, it's operating under code, and to make sure that they are following rules that are put out there by the FBMY to make sure it's safe. So obviously during this time there were no operations because there was no new violations in this continue to operate more and more hypocrisy and every business in new york city should be looking at this and they should they should be extremely perturbed so you mentioned the state the liquor authority and i'm showing this other article they wrote almost a week after and it says right here the state liquor authority has opened an investigation into a popular restaurant and bar owned by a brother of the New York City Police Commissioner following a city's reporting on fire safety and building code violations. And it says right here, Richard Caban, the brother of uh, Ed Caban, was frequently seen there, according to SLA records, is the owner. And it says, look, they violated, look, a 500-square-foot party shed, concert free erected in his parking lot adjacent to the restaurant. And a lawsuit to evict the area landlord property is called the shed an imminent threat to both petitioner and the public. Right here, department buildings issued a violation in June 2022, showing that the plywood shed was built without a permit. The owner has yet to provide the department of buildings with documentation that the facility was built up the code. So the violation remains open. August 2022, FDNY fire inspectors issued 17 violations, including failure to install a required fire suppression system in the shed and failure to maintain the fire rated construction in the restaurant then in october of last year the fdmy returned and issued one vi more violation specifically related to the shed charging the restaurant would fail to obtain a certificate of operation for public assembly space accommodating 161 people this is uh, unbelievable. The, the consorting that, that was going on at Contra Fritos was obviously going on some time. This, this violation was there, I'm sure, uh, much longer prior to August of 2022. This is when the violation was actually implemented and administered. 
So, so that, that clearly shows, shows why there's such a disdain from the New York City Police Department to, to myself and John McCarry with our podcast, and of course you yourself, who's the actual complainant in your lawsuit. So why? Because post-September 2022 is when the three of us provided a platform to present this hypocrisy to show that Sal Greco was wrongfully terminated. So that's why there's a complete disdain and attack on myself and John and, of course, Sal through different threats, uh, threats of aggravated harassment, a complete smear campaign because we collectively have exposed the hypocrisy of the New York City Police Department. This by far is the worst administration I've ever seen that lacks integrity. And now you saw that other article I just posted it from the New York Daily News that stated that uh, they agreed in the court orders, they agreed in a stipulation that they, number one, were operating illegally. So it's all true. Everything I said is true. They admitted to it in a court and that they're saying that they'll pay back $14,000 to the, to the landlord for their legal fees. Plus, they owe another 7000 plus for the water bill. They didn't pay the rent from July of 23 up until January or February it was. It states right in that article they agreed to leave by August. That shed was up illegally the entire time. And here's the best part here. I'm going to show you this Twitter post here. This is Concert Free in the Bronx owned by NYPD Police Commissioner Ed Caban's brother, frequented by New York City Mayor Eric Adams, the New York State Attorney General Tish James, Bronx DA uh, Darcel Clark, Carl Hasty, the Assembly Speaker of New York, and others. This was what was on the, the walls and in the party room. Is this a place you would have people patronize? And this was from March 11th. And now I understand why the New York City Department of Buildings deemed the structure unsafe, yet the New York State Liquor Authority granted them a liquor license, and New York City Police Department Police Commissioner Ed Caban's brother still used this space for parties, irrespective of it being deemed unsafe. Here's the first picture. This is what it looks like right now as of, as of, the, of last week. This is the restaurant. Now, there's the shed. Now you see the inside of the shed. This is not a foundation. This is not plywood. Do you see that? This is not a, like two by fours. I don't even know how to describe this because I'm not a builder. Does this seem safe to you at all? Just, just for the appearance. appearance. I, for me, no. no. You, know, you know, again, yeah, I, I'm just, just, just yourself. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a builder. I'm pretty handy, handy, but just for just, just the appearance, I, I, I would say no. Doubt. The point here is, Eric, this is their studs right here. Remember, there was that covering that you couldn't see that stud because they put this little green leaf thing to make it look like it's covering it. But as you could tell, this is the shell of this little party room, and there's the restaurant. So this is where they were holding all those parties because they can't have all these people in a restaurant because they don't even have the certificate of occupancy for this thing because it's completely illegal. And they went to court for the um, regards to the COVID stuff. And they tried to get that relief and they were found, uh, they, were, they were rejected and said this didn't fall under the COVID, the outdoor dining thing. Here's another picture of it. You see that? This is a completely illegal structure. It was built completely illegally. How this was allowed to happen with all of these famous people going there is... Absolutely unbelievable. It's it's um, it's it's unbelievable. Out of this, Eric, there were I saw this article that was written in the New York Post yesterday about you and John. And John had come on last episode and mentioned how apparently Jimmy Rodriguez himself threatened him in regards to is it the articles? Was it because you guys retweeted me? Was it because you're being critical of, of the of Eddie Caban? Can you explain how this coalesces or, or combines into now you're tagged into this? Because you did make an internal affairs complaint also. And you did make a criminal complaint on Jimmy Rodriguez. And nobody's reporting that. So, so John and I on the podcast, we definitely have a perspicacious mindset or insight when it comes to the police department and how these uh, attacks towards myself and John. And when it comes to Constantino, specifically John himself. A specific target, and I say per perspicacious insight, is that it's obvious that the NYPD, the upper echelon, is filling Jimmy Rodriguez himself, really, I believe, who is the, actually the true owner of Consafritos, information about this podcast to direct, direct 
his attention away from the police department from what's happening, but actually directs his attention to, to, to this podcast. So it really works out for the NYPD because the NYPD is trying to shut down this podcast. Mm -hmm. So, and they believe, they see Sean actually founded the podcast. We joined up together we, we, you know, to give out a perspective analysis. So the, I believe that they... That their ultimate goal is if they shut John down, I believe they they figure if they shut John down, they'll shut the entire podcast. And by directing the the attention and diverting Jimmy Rodriguez's attention away from the police department, because it's the police department, the upper echelon, that's bringing the spotlight on him. Well, let me just say this: that myself and John McCarry, we don't have a beef with Jimmy Rodriguez. Our beef is with the police department exposing hypocrisy. But Jimmy Rodriguez, his business has been the byproduct of this. Not because of us, but because of the police department. So what we did is we had a, a, a we had a podcast, we had a show with you several times where we exposed the hypocrisy that he was wrongly terminated, and yet the police department is consorting with a known criminal who is likely to engage in criminal activities as we speak going forward. The entire entire police department is associated. Why? Because leadership affects the entire rank and file. So the police commissioner himself is consorting at at Consapritos, having parties there. I mean, this is the party administration. John McCarry was actually contacted on his Instagram, directly towards his Instagram, from uh, Jimmy Rodriguez himself. And basically, some substance was saying that we're going to meet soon, which is a complete threat. So, obviously, John McCarry and myself have not had any contact with Jimmy Rodriguez. We don't have any personal dealings with him. We are not attacking him personally. Or attacking the police department. I don't even think he had any knowledge that we exist or even a podcast. So that's why I say perspicacious mindset to believe it's obvious that the NYPD, which most likely comes from Ed Caban, the police commissioner himself, has given information to Jimmy Rodriguez to divert his attention to John McCarry, John McCarry and myself and actually specific threats on Instagram. So along with that, we were also receiving threats from a cop or whatever rank he is, an active member of the service, hiding behind a, a moniker known as All Cops Are Woke. We received threats to our families, threats to our kids, and actually, this particular moniker put out a post saying, well, you shut down my boss, and now my CEOs are going to come for you. My boss's restaurant. So we know this is all tied in together. John and I were receiving phone calls on a daily basis, threats, threats to our lives. I actually received uh, fake text messages from an unknown number that uh, entire threats uh, that they're basically coming to get me. And they even drew out a map uh, from supposedly this uh, all cops and walkers in Nebraska. They drew out a map to Florida with pictures of zip ties and duct tape, and saying that, you know, you, you, hopefully your families have a long life, and pictures of, of adults with kids, not our kids, but, you know, but insinuating that they're coming after our families. We made a complaint to the internal affairs. We were very tolerant of attacks on us until it came towards our families, and of course, a no mob associate here, Jimmy Rodriguez, attacking John McCarry himself. So, I can say this, the Internal Affairs Bureau at this point, their investigation has been short of transparent, and they really showed a lack of compassion and care for the lives of myself and John, our families, because they are refusing and unwilling to disclose the information of who is behind all cops and walk when they've admitted that person has been identified, is an active member of the service, and as a result has resigned from the police department. But they will not disclose the information, and they have not taken an active, active stance and tried to interview Jimmy Rodriguez for these threats towards John McCarry. I think this is despicable and disgusting. And if something does happen, the liability is on the police department. And if this investigation does not show transparency and reveal this information, John and I will take this to a higher authority, and this will not be the end of it. In this investigation, did you not find that there were other cops that were also messaging you? Some of those cops, you actually correlated with the 45th Precinct that they work there. And the significance of this is Consafrito, which again, I keep reiterating, is in the industrial section of the Bronx, right off of Zuriga Avenue, and it's on Commerce. That's, is that not in the 45th Precinct? I mean, this, the 45th Precinct had a party there. 
not to mention, just, just to throw it out there. The, they had a party there probably more than once. I've caught numerous pictures of them there. So you have an, people from that precinct that were threatening you that we know they've had parties there and it's not too far from the precinct. I mean, does any of this make sense to you, Eric? I mean, you could kind of see what I'm trying to draw here. Absolutely not. So first of all, I myself, I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences at all. So just to paint a picture so people get an idea of how narrow it is this is and how it's connected, there's a complete nexus and that this is all connected. There's 79 precincts in New York City Police Department, 12 transit districts, and nine PSAs. And then we have about 100 different locations of specialized units. And then we have one police plaza on top of that. There's a large police department that covers a vast amount of geographical area of New York City. Is it a coincidence that Casa Fritos is in the confines of the 4-5 precinct? John and I have been attacked, including yourself, from Jimmy Rodriguez, who is what we believe the actual owner of Casa Fritos. All cops awoke had threatened us. We would get numerous prank calls on a daily basis. One of the references was that his boss's place was shut down and the CEOs would come to get us. And then, after making the internal affairs allegation, which is supposed to be confidential, we get contacted from a detective in the 4-5 precinct. His name is Sean Lisko, in support of All Cops Are Woke, telling us that All Cops Are Woke is not an active member of the service and that we are rats. A rat is someone you commit a crime with and then they provide the information to tell on you. We didn't commit a crime with you, Sean Lisko. So this detective contacts us. He initiates contact, initiates the contact on social media and Instagram and says that it's definitely not an active member that it's a, it's a young girl, from a, a 14 or 15 year old girl from Nebraska. So I find that extremely problematic. So are you either defending an unhitched cop or are you contacting, staying in contact with an underage girl? So which one is it? They're both problematic, but clearly tied to Consafritos. That's why I want to know if Internal Affairs is doing their proper investigation. This detective, Works in the 4 5 precinct detective squad. Contrafritos is in the confines of the 4 5 precinct. And we also include in our allegation the higher ups that consort at Contrafritos. Yes, and the fact that they associate with him, they clearly have an issue with all, all three of us, apparently. And that could be Deputy Commissioner Kaz Daudry, he himself, who has been a Contrafrito chief. Of department Jeffrey Madry, he himself who has been to Concerfrito, they've been he's been pictured there as well. Chief of Patrol John Shell, who's been pictured with Jimmy Rodriguez. First Deputy Commissioner Tanya Kinsella, who's been pictured with Jimmy Rodriguez. It's just the list could go on and on. Do you see how it's an intricate web? And I myself am very interested in why Letitia James, who is prosecuting Donald Trump right now, trying to take his properties and all this stuff, she had a a, a campaign staffer. Her chief of staff allegedly sexually assaulted and raped her own campaign staffer. That lawsuit has been hidden, by the way, but it's out there. It's the New York Post reporting on it, and then all of a sudden there's radio silence. Now, that lawsuit's proceeding forward. And i just like to know if, I don't know, do her staffers, does her chief of staff, does anyone on her staff know Jimmy Rodriguez and hang out at this place? Because, I don't know, she's been going there. She's friends with this guy. What is her relationship to this guy? Because you as the attorney general who are associating with mob associates and and, and in a place that has no business other than if you're going to raid the place, you have no business being there. If you go there one time, like I said, it's unsuspecting. But you clearly, Letitia James is clearly not unsuspecting. She goes there. She knows the guy. What are you doing there? This is an this is a bar complaint. Donald Trump's lawyers, President Trump's lawyers, should jump on this immediately. Letitia James, Darcel Clark, they should get phone calls nonstop. This place operating illegal had this shed. You're all over there. I don't know if you know about it or not, but guess what? You were there, and if something would have went wrong, or maybe something went wrong, we don't know about. You were endangered. Your life, everything, your safety was put in danger. That's clearly a crime. What are you going to do about it? This is endangering the, the welfare of the public. This is, a, I believe, a Class D felony. So 
uh, if you're Richard Caban right now, you should be very worried that you don't get prosecuted for something because you clearly operated this place in complete disregard of every rule and law that exists because you kept having the parties there. And you know what? If it is, let's say it is him. Let's say it's not him. You want to start blaming Jimmy Rodriguez, even though he's not on paper is anything. He says he's the creative manager of the place, but he's clearly there every day. So if he's a manager, then he also could maybe possibly, I think, know about this. I mean, if he is the manager or the owner or whatever, he would know that this place was operating like this. That would hold both of them accountable for this act. And I'm stating that the police department is complicit because Ed Caban, who's his brother, can never have plausible deniability. It's your brother. You're going to tell me you don't know what's going on over there? You don't know that do you have this thing and everything's being done illegal? And there's part. You're there every night with him. You're there. You're in so many. Ed Caban's face, other than Richard Caban and, and, and Jimmy Rodriguez, is the most common person, the most common face there. He's the most recognizable figure out of Concert Frito. And I believe that the media, like the New York Post, the, New, the Daily News wrote a nice article there to explain everything, but th they don't go to a press conference. Nobody shoves a microphone in Eric Adams' face or Letitia James' face or any of these people's face, Eddie Caban especially. And New York City Police Department, you know, they have crime going through the roof. They have all these problems in New York. You got transit crime. Why can't someone specifically, even New York Post, who've refused to write about this, ask them, what is your affiliation with this place? Why do you go there? How many fundraisers have you been involved in? Why would you have parties there? Don't you know this guy's a criminal and a mob associate? Don't you know Caban's operating illegally? What? Give us, I mean, what do you think, Eric? I mean, I find this is a, unbelievable that nobody wants to cover any of this. Letitia James and the... the you have every law enforcement part of the state and the city involved in this place that has nothing but, I mean, Peter Guns is a felon. Peter Guns is a known felon. You got Fat Joe hanging out there. I mean, you got all these criminals hanging out there. These are just the ones that you, you, you recognize, you know, coming right out off the screen, you know. I'm not just picking on them. I don't really care for either one of them. They could sing their songs, dance. I don't care what they do. But these are two recognizable criminals, we'll say, that's out in the front that you're going, why the hell are these guys hanging out there? This right away would trigger an investigation. In my eyes, I'd start writing things up. I'd already be forming theories, hypotheses on how things could be. And I would immediately start questioning people and rolling into trying to get subpoenas and stuff. I don't understand why everybody's sitting on their hands, whether it's internal affairs, department of investigation, the FBI, uh, they're all just si sitting around. What are, you, what are you doing? Why is nothing being done here? Nobody's being looked at. Letitia James is the head of the state. Why is she not being asked or investigated? She should be in the bar explaining herself. Why are you pictured and associating with this guy? Because you are the attorney general of the state. If Donald Trump is such a bad guy, then what are you doing with Richard Caban and Jimmy Rodriguez? Explain yourself. Well, let's break this down, right? There's a lot of layers. This is a, a giant onion that we have to peel. To say that they're unsuspecting, I, I think is completely wrong what it's saying when it comes to these people. If you sell yourself or myself at our level, we don't, we don't have security teams. If we would go go into a function and patronize it, we can be in a location that may be unsuspecting, but even then we would make our observations and it would actually surface and we would realize we're in a establishment that is that has an appearance of impropriety. But to say Letitia James or Ed Cabet or May Eric Adams is unsuspecting, I think is a complete farce because they have security teams. And we know that before these high profile political figures go to an establishment, their security team will do a survey of that location to make sure it's safe and check for those reasons also. Which, to me, makes me believe that this is this whole thing at Consafritos is far bigger than just a great place to party, great place to eat, and also the affiliation with the brother of Ed Caban where you can get a good deal and not pay. To, to me, there's obviously something going on here much larger. So I could also say this, why it's not unsuspected. Years ago, a cop that used to work for me, thank God he's okay and he's, still, he's strong. He had leukemia. And I myself, along with a couple other members of the service, we put together what's called a 1013. So 1013 is the radio code for officer needs help. That's what shit hits the fan. 
So, so we, we put, put together what's called a 1013 fundraiser at a bar restaurant, restaurant to, to raise funds to help this particular cop with, with his disease. disease. And, and I, at the time, to, to have a 1013, I had to have it authorized from, from the Internal Affairs Bureau of the New York City Police Department. Department. Along with that, I had to fill out several pieces of paperwork, which included background checks of the location we were having the fundraiser, which included warrant checks of members of the establishment, which included history checks to know what type of place we're going to have a fundraiser to make sure they're not engaged or likely to engage in criminal activity. To say this is unsuspecting is far from the truth. Everyone knows. Again, I say it on a lower level. I myself, I might go in there as a patron or Sal or John or someone else and may not know. But these people are high-profile figures and their security teams do their homework and survey establishments before they patronize it, especially where it's a party that has a brochure by the New York City Police Department that is all over social media, which is highly likely that there's going to be paparazzi and this will be in the papers. So what are we exposing? Potential corruption. So ultimately, I believe what happens in the dark will come out in the light. So what is actually going on at Consafritos will come out, which is why I believe they diverted their attention to Jimmy Rodriguez, to John McCarry, and myself, particularly John McCarry, in this actual post, to divert the attention of what is actually going on there. My only feelings and reaction here is that, uh, you know, I saw a lot of money and attention from the New York City Police Department, also the January 6th committee and other entities that were put into me, even though the entire time there was nothing there and they admitted this, but they still did it. But yet here, there's a lot. I mean, if I if this was a puzzle, you throw the pieces down, you'd be putting it together real quick. These people are very clearly involved in something, whether it's there's free meals, there's a fundraisers, there's a are they selling access? These are all things that you keep hearing over and over again here. But yet people are afraid. I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. But you see these high profile people. Yes, they're all Democrats as well. I don't, I don't know if they're afraid to mention that it's it, it, they're trying to say this is a race based thing. It's a gender based thing. It's a, a nationality based thing. Whatever happened to just doing your job? I mean, me and you did our job. We didn't look at somebody and worry about what's their race, what's their gender. If they were committing a crime, so be it. I mean, then it is what it is. We have to do what we have to do. In this instance, I have a lot to work with that could form already some sort of a theory or a hypothesis that I believe X, Y, and Z is happening here. And you know something? If I just take a few steps forward, I think I have something here. I hit pay dirt. I mean, State Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty is pictured at Concertfredo sitting next to Jimmy Rodriguez calling him his friend. This is the same guy who's been... Already numerous times have been alleged to have been involved in straw donor schemes. Jimmy himself has been throwing fundraisers since the, 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 the 90s of his place. And remember, he's associated to Bill and Hillary Clinton. I mean, you know, you could just draw puzzles around this and say to yourself, what's really going on here? And yes, it is political because if Sal Greco were to have, let's say, associated with this place or with these people, would I have been treated the same way? Because obviously I'm affiliated with the other side of the equation. I'm a Trump guy. If I was a Bill Clinton or Joe Biden guy, look at all these other guys that are just sitting there and they still have their jobs. People getting promoted. Hey, we have one guy who gave a misleading statement, kept his job. They said I gave a misleading statement, which is not true. Because no, I was never Roger Stone security. I got hit with this and that's how they used it to terminate me saying this. Plus the fact that you're wrongfully and knowingly associated with someone who's likely to engage in criminal activity. That's why we must fire you. But this individual, Kaz Daudry, impeded an investigation. He lied. The same charge they said I did. Yet he was only given 20 vacation days. Then promoted three ranks. And he's running around as a civilian with a gun acting like he's still a cop. This is... What I'm trying to tell you, nepotism, the way it's running in the NYPD, the way it's run by Eric Adams right now and Eddie Caban, if he even is the police commissioner, nobody's seen it. The only time you see Eddie Caban, when it's party time, time to hand out awards, kind of like Eric Adams is a glorified Brooklyn Borough president, Curtis Lee was, likes to say, Eddie Caban is a glorified, like, 
deputy commissioner where he's out there to shake hands, give awards, and go and party. And I always see him around women, too. I mean, that should also be an alarming thing. So Eddie Caban is a police commissioner, but yet he's never around to answer any questions for the police department. Everyone else is making political statements, whether it's Chief Token Paleface Kemper, Chief Token Paleface Shell. They're all out there making political statements, which goes against what the NYPD is supposed to do. It's supposed to be the police commissioner. Usually, I mean, we were used to this under Ray Kelly. He made all those, he came out and said this kind of stuff. Not them. They're making political statements going against judges. I mean, this is outrageous stuff. You're not a politician, and public safety should never be a political issue. But somehow, under this administration, it's, it's become that. It's all that. It's, that's all it is. And on the flip side, these characters that we mentioned before, they're, they're sitting there partying. And then you got the, the district attorney. You have a Carl Hasty, the assembly leader. You have all these politicians, all these state senators. All the, What are they all doing in the same place? Because remember, Eric, when you start to see every branch of government, plus the cops, plus criminals and felons, all in the same place, red flag right off the bat. Kaz Daughtry and Ed Caban in comparison to... Ray Kelly. So I spent a majority of my career under Ray Kelly as the police commissioner. Whether we agreed with his policies 100% or his leadership style or his record of being tough with discipline, what we can all agree with is that he was a leader and it was known and it was obvious that he was the police commissioner and he was, there was a pyramid which led to him as the leader. What we see with the police department right now is it's unknown who's actually in charge. It appears Kaz Daughtry is the actual de facto police commissioner, but there's not a clear, obvious direction or sighting of who's actually in charge of the police department. Is it Mayor Eric Adams? Is it Philip Banks? Is it John Shell? Is it Kaz Daughtry? Is it Therese Shepard? Is it Kinsella? It's a tiny Kinsella. We don't know. It kind of juggles around. That's a major problem that we don't have direct leadership. That's what we had under Ray Kelly. Would things be different if Ray Kelly was under Mayor Eric Adams? I would say Ray Kelly, if he operated the manner he did, he'd probably be, he'd be removed. So if he wanted to continue, he would have to fall in line as those pale faces are falling in line as we speak. Huge problem. Also, what we see with the media right now is they're very careful. They're walking on eggshells when it comes to this administration because this administration has shown the least amount of transparency when it comes to the media. And they have blocked out the media in many things, which includes the encryption of radios as we speak. It's not about safety. It's about being least transparent towards the media so the media does not expose what's actually going on with this administration. I completely agree, Eric. And uh, I'm going to say this in the closing moments here. Nothing here is being taken personal. I don't personally care about anyone I, I mentioned here. What I care about is the public's interest and the public safety and the public's interest, the common citizen, not the people that are in charge. I'm out here saying this, okay, because this is the biggest part. If you want to go do those things or be involved with those people, take that badge off of your shirt, go throw it wherever it is in the garbage, in the toilet, and go be a thug. Because that's what you want to be. You want to be a thug? You want to be a gangster? You want to both rap your song? Then go do that on your own time. You can't be a public official or a cop at the same time. You just can't do it. You can't do those two positions and be a thug and a criminal. Or you want to act like you're a rapper or whatever it is. You can't do that. You serve the people. You serve the public. But if you want to sit there and act like a celebrity and... You know, the social media thing's out of control, too, with the NYPD. All these guys on social media. I remember as a cop, they told me I couldn't even be on there. You never found one picture of me in uniform until after I was terminated. Anywhere. And also, my Instagram, whatever I had back in that time period when they were uh, trying to investigate me, was completely private. And there was nothing that anyone I didn't know didn't have. There was no police officers that said, I have an Instagram and there's stuff. Uh, you wouldn't even see me pictured at a, at a place a, a place like this. This was These places were forbidden. I mean, it was these were so strict, the, the guidelines and the rules we had that, you know, you took pride in what you did because you couldn't be around these kind of people, we'll say, like, you know, people that could be engaging in a criminal activity or 
engaged in it as we speak, and also in a place like this. And this is where it needs to stop, because we were on a job where we swore an oath, not omerta, to some police commissioner or something like that, or some mayor. The media is completely soft on this particular administration. They're afraid of being locked out and actually not getting access, which is why the issue of the encryption radios is a major problem, because it leaves room to corrupt the actual statistics of public safety, what's actually going on in the city. It actually leaves room to give a different perception to the public. They keep talking about perception. It leaves room for actually deception. So you're 100% right. You know, I know we have a major focus here at Consafritos because it really highlights the entire police department has been completely hypocritical, been drunk with power. So ultimately, the entire police department should be terminated just as you were. We talk about politics, right? So it's quite interesting because if you had association with Biden's son, you'd probably still be employed by the New York City Police Department, which is another faulty problem how politics has penetrated the New York City Police Department. We have weak, egotistical, tyrannical, immature, inadequate, and inept leadership of the New York City Police Department now, and they've been put there because they are feeble and stupid-minded, and they will do exactly what they're told by Mayor Eric Adams and follow the direction of this administration, even though they know as they, they tell the cops to do things that they're paid and trained to do that's going to cost them civil liability and other type issues, but they're not there to stand for them. They're there to stand for their self-serving careers and also pave the way for their offspring. This whole ball of wax comes down to nepotism. Nepotism is a huge problem. Yes, is there a form of nepotism in any organization? Yes, it's something that you will never get rid of it, but it's something that can be monitored and dealt with at a... It's something that we can tolerate. But the nepotism that we see right now in the New York City Police Department and other agencies throughout New York City and the entire state it's just completely egregious, and it's something that we've never seen. And it's a phenomenon that's really controlling the political theater of New York State and creating just a, a completely hostile environment. And that's why we have mass amount of residents fleeing New York City, fleeing New York State. What business would want to operate right now in New York City with violations and have to shut their business down or pay astronomical fines in court because of fines for the SLA, while at the same time watching Consafritos operate with total impunity from this administration. Complete hypocrisy. Let's keep exposing this hypocrisy. Sal, I, I think what you're doing is outstanding. I consider you a great friend. If you ever need anything, I will be there to assist you. You know, I said, you know, John and I will continue to provide support to you because you deserve it. You represent Every other police officer, rank and file, that has been wronged by the New York City Police Department. Let's keep up this fight. Let's keep going. Well, thanks for that, Eric. You know, I consider you a friend. I'm, I'm going to say this here. For anybody that says that Eric is a dirty cop or I associate with dirty, I'm going to say this. Eric's never been charged with anything criminally. Civilly, you know, I don't know if people know this, but back in this day under Mayor Bloomberg, which was a great time to be a cop, but also... There were lawyers that made a fortune on making lawsuits against cops because Mayor Bloomberg, I don't know if you realize this, I think he had the most settlements other than, I think I think de Blasio didn't beat him, but the settlements, Bloomberg would settle for anything. You allege the cop beat you up, he'd give you five grand. He don't care because he just didn't want to be boggled down in lawsuits. It's an actual fact. So look this up and you see what I mean. So Eric being a busy, active cop was an easy target for any any crazy allegation and then they an overzealous civilian complaint review board that governs uh these uh allegations they they took it out on eric and that's what happened eric there's nothing dirty about him they weaponized the system to make it work for them for their pocket it's pretty simple it's just that's how it works that's life they do the same thing in politics so for anyone who says that there's a little history lesson for you. So I'm honored to call Eric my friend. I'm also honored to call John McCarty my friend. I think because of their friendship with me is how this whole Consofrito slash Jimmy Rodriguez thing spilled into them, to be honest. Because they just feel like Eric and John present a problem to their their friends in the police department, apparently. But that's 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 how I see it. So with that being said, uh, Eric, uh, one last thing up. Uh, uh, you want to tell everybody where to see the podcast or the website or they could get any of your merchandise anywhere. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. So it's New York's finest retired and unfiltered podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, Amazon, Rumble, 
and uh, Podbean and many more. And along with that, you can find myself on uh, Twitter, Most Complaint Cop, on Instagram as well. And you can find my partner, John D. McCarry, all over Twitter. Most Complaint Cop on Twitter. I wear that moniker as a mocking the natural system. I was attacked being an alpha white male that was actually retrieving illegal firearms off the street. Again, I own it. Do I have complaints and allegations? I sure do. I own every one of them. They come from most, some of the most volatile, violent, adversary perpetrators you will see in the entire city, and most of them are in custody, and thank God for that. So, I'm proud to wear that moniker, proud to wear that, because I know that I did my job, and I did it well. The same thing, uh, you know, kudos to my partner, John McCarry, who stood up against the mandate, and he took a stance on moral principle, and uh, you know what? Had we still been with the New York City Police Department, we probably would have a trajectory being to which keeps ourselves. But you know what? We're on a bigger and better path, and Sal, you're on that path with, with us. The strength in numbers and the strength in unity, and we're doing this together. We've, we've formed a bond, and the bond is in virtue and it's in, in righteousness and doing the right thing. And it, it, it's unfortunate, but it seems that doing the right thing is not something that comes so easy. And I, I, unfortunately, I found that in my endeavors here in my last tenure of my career and of course in post and uh, in retirement so to all those that are watching this i thank you please find us please watch the podcast please support sal greco if you're currently in the nypd if you support sal greco you support yourself it's important that we are critical of management that which creates humility and balance and ask yourself would you associate at concert fritos you yourself knowing the appearance of impropriety. And the answer would be no. And if you are a business out there, how do you feel about Contra Fritos getting special treatment while you potentially could be shut down and paying all kinds of fines? Completely unfair. And I'm sure whatever's bigger and better going on out there, eventually will be exposed and we will find out. Thank you so much for giving this platform. Please check us out. Also, you'll see when we do New York's finest, we try to fill the podcast. We do what's called a 265 Police Live Series. The 265 Police Live Series is where we give perspective analysis on politics and also policing and an array of topics. And in addition to that, we do separate from that interviews, which are on the podcast. We interview cops. We interview politicians. We memorialize people's careers. It's a complete array of different topics, a new genre, new media outlet for policing and politics. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I myself watch your show all the time, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the show. I've been on the show a few times, and look, I know some of the stuff they say may or may not be controversial, even myself, even some of the guests they've had on, but it, it's very informative for people to watch this show. Whether you're an NYPD cop, retired, or maybe law enforcement, you just want to hear about what the hell's going on out there law enforcement-wise, these guys break it down better than anyone else. It's almost as if they're in the room with Eric Adams and them breaking down their policies because they're all horrendous. So, uh, well, well, like 90% of it's uh, horrible. With that being said, I mean, I'm running up the clock here with everything. So this has been an episode where we specifically highlighted not only the corruption and hypocrisy, but this is a place that I don't know how no one else has been talking about it. It's right out in the open, and yet it's like everybody skips over it. So hopefully we've now we, we put this to bed where now everyone could kind of see the veil that's been lifted on this Conta Frito. Eddie Caban, the police commissioner, Eric Adams is the mayor who has a ton of problems, and I don't know how he's going to survive this. But all of this is now out there. So you out there in the audience, now you decide because you are the people that we are targeting. I'm targeting you people to show you this is what's going on. Here's the information. If I still had a gun and shield, I know how this should be investigated. I don't. Eric doesn't either. We're we're gone. Now it's up to you to demand accountability. Now it's up to you to demand that there are answers and why people aren't actually looking into things that matter. They spent a lot of money chasing me and Eric around for no reason and ended up with nothing. Meanwhile, who's investigating them? Who's looking at Sergeant Jeremy Ornstein from Internal Affairs, who is in multiple lawsuits now where he purged himself, but he still has a job and a pension, so he's still doing these things. His boss, Lieutenant Daniel Cutter, he's in a few lawsuits. In fact, there's one coming with him that he... Did the same thing Ornstein does. Keyshawn Sewell, she was a good police commissioner from all accounts, apparently. The only problem is she's associating with this guy, Jimmy Rodriguez, and hanging out at that place, Concerfrito. That's one of the allegations here. Eddie Caban, who's, I don't know, 
why he's hanging around Jimmy Rodriguez. Maybe the fact that, I don't know, his brother is his business partner. These are things you need to know. And when you start looking at it and you start breaking this down piece by piece, you'll start to see things very clear. And then you can make up your own mind. And that's what we do on the Sal Greco Show. I like to highlight things that are corrupt. I like to highlight police department activities. I like to highlight political things. And also, yeah, I like to eat too. And uh, we're going to highlight some businesses as we go forward and stuff like that. So if you like what you, what you heard here, if you like what you're hearing, click the link below. You can press the button to subscribe. You can share the link. You can spread the word everywhere. Because uh, I intend on uh, growing this more and more and more as the weeks progress. And with that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Eric Dim, for coming on, my good friend. Make sure you go to his show and subscribe and watch there too. And uh, I'll see you on the next one.